We'd like to um, welcome you all very warmly, all the people who are watching and all our lovely panelists that are here with us today. Um, it's been a very interesting session so far uh, and summit, uh, starting off with John Bell. Um, we are um, having our session today where we are asking our panelists and you are who are participating to think deeply with us on uh, our sy systemic thinking on urban landscapes and nature-based solutions. And we're thinking, how are we disrupting towards harmony or this idea of making peace with nature that John is speaking about this morning, especially over the next 30 years as we get into really implementing and bringing forward the European Green Deal. Um, my name is Roisin Byrne and I'm a landscape architect uh, nature-based landscape architect and also co-ambassador with Barbara America for urban landscapes on the Connecting Nature platform. Uh, we must say that this is recorded and will be available on the platform after the event. Um, and we really look forward to your particip participating with joining in our discussion. Um, to do that, we, Mike has just said there, all the chat and questions and answers could be there. If you want to jump in at the second part, we really invite you uh, by putting your comment or question up in the questions and answers section. And we would like to really bring you in as much as you like. Um, so uh, we by inviting Barbara to speak and share her perspective. Over to you, Barbara. Hi there. Thank you, Rosie. Um, so um, I'm Barbara Golichnik Marusic. I'm a head of research at the Urban Planning Institute of the Republic of Slovenia, which is a national research center for urban planning and related disciplines. My background is in landscape architecture, and um, I've got a PhD from the University of Edinburgh, UK. But at the Institute, uh, I currently work on the nature-based solutions as a concept, as well as a set of actual solutions in relation to urban planning and design. And I'd like to share with you some thoughts related to that this early afternoon. Um, so just to briefly remind, nature-based solutions are solutions based on the principles of nature either using the elements of nature or and simulating its processes and the principles. In urban planning and design, there is a need for understanding nature-based solutions with the parameters of planning. Respecting by that their original connectivity, of course, to biodiversity, green infrastructure and urban open space development, design and maintenance, but going beyond provision of, let's say, green, green, blue infrastructure and addressing also urban morphology, built structure patterns, materials used and uh, buildings orientation, for example. This is especially crucial as in, for example, again, in historic city centers or any other dense urban areas, there is often not enough room to introduce green spaces to achieve the wanted uh, effect. So what I want to say is that nature in cities does not apply only to green or blue spaces. Physical world processes are also parts of nature. For example, geological processes, matter and, uh, and the energy processes. And in that sense, properties of the location, such as um, natural ventilation by wind blow, local materials, their use, uh, also closeness of their resources, such as natural stone, wood, or shading because of the steepness of the location, orientation of the location, also orientation of the existing and the plant building structure on it. They all can be very well addressed also by the nature-based solutions, or at least by potentials for applying nature-based solutions. So for the purpose of urban landscape planning and design, I'd like to support an argument also for seeing nature-based solutions as a system. 
going beyond single interventions such as green roof here, green wall there, uh, rain garden somewhere else, and so on. In urban planning, we should be heading for connecting solutions of different kinds to solve specific issues or challenges. So when setting up a system of solutions, then it is of key importance also a good knowledge about the mutual effects of different nature-based solutions or the multifaceted effects of individual solutions. And these issues have not been adequately addressed so far and really they, it call a broader attention. Also, they have not been specifically studied for different types of urban tissues. So this all also calls an attention to areas of impacts of the nature-based solution. For successful implementation of nature-based solutions in urban landscape, buffer zones of effects or cumulative effects the nature-based solutions might bring to places for people, environment, or even economy are crucial. So some examples, for example, um, just as an illustration in practice, how much rainfall water from the built areas of a city can be captured by the nearby park? Was it adequately planned? Was it adequately designed? How big it should be? What orientation and the ratio of planted and unplanted areas to have to successfully play also the role for cooler? Or what size and shape and with what ratio of open and planted or shaded areas it should have again to successfully meet users' needs or expectations for rest and recreation. So how far away from it the next nature-based solution, not necessarily a park, should be introduced to cover such or similar issues in the cities, which we all know range from greenhouse gas emissions and temperature reduction, uh, urban water cycle control and, and an improvement, noise reduction, air quality improvement, and so on. So uh, these are the messages I wanted to, to spread. If we still have time, I have a slide which I would kindly ask Mansa to share just to make those key points. I want to stress the um, understanding of the nature-based solutions within the parameters of planning, a recognition of nature-based solution in the physical world processes as part of nature, and in relation to that, of course, the potentials of location. To see nature-based solutions as a system, also to develop a good knowledge about the effects of nature-based solutions, and in relation to that, to pay a greater attention to nature-based solution impact areas to successfully deal with the issues in urban landscape planning and urban landscapes as places. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara. There are a lot of deep thinking points where we think in whole systems and of the effects and the full journeys and interconnection of nature based. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me introduce myself briefly. Uh, so my name is uh, Natasha Tanasova. I'm uh, associate professor at the uh, University of Ljubljana at the Faculty of Civil and Geodetic Engineering. Uh, so my, uh, my background is um, environmental engineering focused mostly on water uh, management and uh, my latest interest and um, what I'm dealing is it mostly uh, is uh, sustainable use of resources. So uh, why I'm saying I'm, uh, I would like to emphasize on the resources because water is um, also food and it's also energy. So uh, basically, if we manage to sustainably, uh, let's say, uh, manage water, it also impacts heavily on how we manage uh, our food systems and energy systems. And when we talk about uh, resources, it means that um, uh, cities are basically the biggest um, um, uh, there is the biggest demand for resources in cities, in urban areas. So uh, our, let's say, uh, major task is uh, management of resources in cities. And um, I would like to briefly present you a few outcomes of um, our 
ongoing cost action, which is named Circular Cities. Okay, so we will just uh, stay with this and um, I will just try to explain the major challenges that we are facing in cities uh, that are related to circular management of resources. So basically, within this action, uh, we have identified like seven major challenges uh, that cities uh, that cities are facing in order to shift to circular management of resources. And when we talk about circular management or what does it mean circular city, it means that this is a city that reduces or minimizes the import of fresh resources and also minimizes waste production. So thank you, uh, Roshin, everybody watching, and to my colleagues on the panel. My name is Patrick McCabe. Um, I'm a landscape architect, uh, architect uh, and founder of uh, Redscape. So that's uh, an office uh, that works primarily in the Netherlands and also uh, in Ireland. And um, I've been actually asked to contribute to the discussion today from the perspective of the landscape architect. Um, and just maybe to explain that uh, our company is called uh, Redscape. And that is about connecting uh, different parts uh, of the city. So it's red is the symbol of the built environment uh, with scape, which is the unbuilt environment uh, to create a kind of an approach called Redscape uh, to actually deliver synergies between both. And we do that by also adding um, different values into this approach, such as uh, nature based solutions, uh, co-creation and um, various other ideas, such as uh, reinventing the sense of space within that as well. I think um, uh, it's important maybe to, to, to mention that uh, central to all our projects uh, is the whole idea of community um, and actually de delivering um, uh, ecologies uh, of communities for each project. So for us, it's perhaps less relevant what the type of project is, whether it's a, a waterfront or a port or whether it's a park uh, or whether it's something else. It's really about creating these ecosystems of, of communities first and foremost. And our experience uh, teaches us that uh, that is the best way to deliver a project uh, with a healthy combination of top down, bottom up, uh, and both of these working together to give a, um, a complete um, a complete community. Uh, the next thing is is that um, is that the, there are three basic qualities uh, that the landscape architect has uh, to offer, um, if you like, uh, this interconnection between different sectors, uh, and that is number one, uh, the idea of co-creation. Uh, so this is obviously not just uh, the the uh, the realm of the landscape architect, but to other other individuals. But this is something that the landscape architect can develop very well. This idea of co-creation. Uh, the second one is um, um, I'm just trying to remember it from the slides. <laughs> uh, the second one is what was it again? Um, excuse me, I know what it is. It's actually uh, design thinking and creativity. So this aspect of nonlinear thinking is extremely important. Uh, this is essentially why we get paid. We, we get paid to uh, deliver creative solutions uh, where one and one is three, put very simply. And so our imaginations can allow us to uh, imagine things and deliver new ideas that wouldn't have been thought of before and with all kinds of benefits. And the third uh, thing which is extremely important is the idea of the plan or the drawing. And um, we have worked off uh, plans and drawings, for example, that are literally 400 years old in terms of assessing new designs. Um, and the example I was to give was a slide of the Bainster Boulder, which is a UNESCO uh, monument. It's 8,000 hectares uh, designed in the 1600s. And we actually use that basic uh, plan uh, for uh, reorganizing parts of the boulder, in particularly the agricultural areas and allotments and the changes in agricultural systems. So I think that's very, very important. If we put these qualities together, we can then apply them and uh, to give directions for new kinds of uh, tasks in the spatial environment across over sectors. And I have three examples. Uh, the first example was um, the idea of um, bio-based chemistry, uh, where we did an exploration into uh, replacing, um, if you like, uh, petroleum-based products with uh, local bio-based products from uh, new forms of agriculture in and around and local to the uh, uh, area of study, which was Tonosa in the south of the Netherlands. So basically, the idea of producing, of replacing these petroleum products with uh, a high uh, value uh, local product 
uh, is certainly feasible and achievable. And again, it creates this interconnection between the chemical industry and the local stakeholders around, for example, in this case, uh, farmers and also nature organizations. Uh, the second project, just to demonstrate, uh, the idea was an international exchange for flood protection that we organized between the Netherlands and Ireland. And those projects were uh, there to demonstrate that, um, in fact, 60% of the solutions uh, could be achieved using uh, nature-based uh, solutions. At the moment, 80 to 85% of the uh, flood protection being proposed uh, in Ireland at the moment is actually based around the idea of walls, which are obviously a uh, huge discontinue for, for biodiversity, but also visual and immunity connection <coughs> to rivers in the various different towns and cities in the country. <coughs> so that's another very good example of how landscape architects can play uh, that role. And uh, the final uh, project that I wanted to show was the idea of uh, the green port, uh, where we actually started studying ports and how they could be better integrated into the city. And as a case study, we took uh, Dublin port and we then uh, pitched the, the story to Dublin Port and they very kindly invited us to work out a component of that, which was called, uh, if you like, the, the Greenway, which is a four kilometer connection around the coast uh, on the north side of the port. And the idea of that is, is that that will uh, be built uh, and it forms part of a wider vision that we have for the port to create uh, the city's third largest park, which is actually circumnavigating uh, the port itself and connecting the city into the port. So, um, yeah, I think that's my presentation. It's about these three basic qualities. And if, um, if uh, landscape architects at least get the opportunity to apply these uh, skills that they have, uh, then they can really begin to, uh, uh, if you like, set the agenda for all kinds of new themes and demonstrate um, spatially how these uh, various objectives uh, could be achieved. And I'm just looking at various uh, examples, but of course, we could also talk about energy transition uh, any number of other kinds of uh, projects and uh, current uh, developments within the city and within the landscapes. Thank you, Roshi. Back to yourself. Thank you very much. It's a really uh, highly and big systems thinking approach, which can be applied locally and regionally and nationally and um, throughout Europe. Um, jumping would like to invite uh, Damjan to present and then we'll bring Natasha on afterwards just to close up the presentation. And um, can are you ready to go, Damjan? Okay, Great. hello everybody. I'm, hello. Uh, I'm Damian Marovic from Diftor, the furniture design studio. My background is in architecture and civil engineering. I am holding precisely in uh, structural dynamics and earthquake engineering. But now, uh, last few years, but also quite some time ago, uh, I started uh, with uh, furniture design. Uh, now, uh, I will not share with you anything but my thoughts. Uh, not, I have not, no presentation except Mansa might share with you a short introduction video that was recorded for the use of this project. This is Damian, the head of development from Houston, innovation-oriented SME from Copa, Slovenia, a country about 60% covered by forests. We develop wooden furniture without artificial materials using domestic wood species, 100% natural processing, with no chemical additives, biodegradable and recyclable. Our furniture won several international design awards and have been recognized as excellent eco products. Thank you, Mansa. <laughs> okay, that was obviously me on this video, but more importantly, uh, there were some pieces of our sitting furniture, which was dominantly uh, for the time, uh, for home use, but uh, we are uh, turning our focus now to furniture for public use and urban spaces. Our designs uh, tend to connect with the nature at least in two points. We tend to use exclusively natural or nature-based materials, and we are trying to design our products in the way that uh, they can be produced and, and used with minimum harm to the environment. 
uh, predominant materialist world. Uh, in the way, all materials are nature-based, but in this context, I understand the nature-based materials as the natural materials, which may be physically modified, <laughs> for example, thermally treated or even treated with some chemicals, natural or nature-based if possible, in order to obtain desired properties, uh, for example, resistant to resistance to humidity or insects, etc., or to obtain desired shape. But the use of these procedures should minimally affect the environment. There is no perpetual mobility in, in this field, of course. <laughs> so minimum harm to environment starts with minimum use of material, minimum transport, minimum use of uh, energy, minimum waste at production, maximum dura duration of use, minimum waste during use and after the end of life cycle of the product, and possibility of recycling and reuse. Uh, technologies for production of furniture as for any other product include tools, machines and consumables that are not necessarily nature-based or ecologically produced. We usually cannot avoid all that. However, in product design, uh, one could consider also this aspect. Uh, nothing is really 100%, but we can try to get as close as possible. Uh, this idealistic picture uh, usually crashes at economics. Uh, when a small producer wants to buy some material, wood for example, the price is much higher than for the big corporation. If you want uh, even guarantees that net material is uh, from sustainable source, it's even worse. Domestic sources are often redeemed in advance by big international players, so only imported wood might be available or its price is affordable. However, its CO2 footprint is much higher. Uh, to enter stores, uh, the new small brand is uh, with the new small brand is very difficult. To convince uh, a municipality, a public institution or a serious companies to use something new is often quite impossible as they use uh, established dealers with uh, well known brands. The producers of wooden products often produce also plastic ones uh, or those with a lot of chemicals. Uh, since it's cheaper, people like them and buy them. Uh, as these products uh, are cheaper, they can throw them away uh, more frequently. So to conclude uh, a little bit this, this presentation from uh, a little bit different aspect uh, that then uh, uh, you other have uh, presentations. Uh, the price of devastation of environment will pay next generations, if there will be any. But uh, why should we, we care about that? Or should we care about that? Uh, the question is how to redirect this perspective, how to raise uh, the awareness of, of that. Perhaps, for the start, uh, with giving a chance to nature-based products in public spaces, in urban landscapes. So, thank you. That was all from me. Natasha, are you ready to go? No, no you want to give it a go because I don't think Rasheen can come in at the minute. So you go and then I'll go after you. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, so I actually was not aware when, when my... Uh, my presentation was interrupted, but um, so I will just briefly um, briefly present a few ideas about uh, circular management of resources. As I mentioned, uh, so we are dealing with sustainable management of resources, mainly water, but as water is uh, related to food and to energy, and uh, we have also many other materials that we can um, we can uh, recover from water and from wastewater, so we we can talk about uh, circle management of resources. Uh, so I will briefly present the latest findings from our cost action, which is called um, Circular City. 
Um, and uh, we have one more, a little bit more than one uh, year ahead uh, in this project. So basically, what does it mean, circular city? Circular city is a city that uh, manages to um, to reduce the import of fresh resources and to reduce the amount of waste. And this can be done with uh, with suitable management um, of resources. What we have identified here is uh, seven challenges in cities that should be addressed that actually cities have when they try to shift their linear, predominantly linear metabolism uh, into circular one. And these seven challenges are uh, how to restore and maintain the water dynamics.